Hey everybody, it's Peter Kerr from Rock Day Dream Nation, and I've got David Boitis back. How's it going, my man? Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. How are you doing? Good, good. You've been listening to a lot of White Stripes, I believe. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Oh, good stuff. Um, coincidentally, we're doing a White Stripes show, and we are going to cover each of their albums and pick or spotlight two of our favourite songs from each album. Hey, we may have some crossovers. I don't care. We're just going to talk the White Stripes and just do a bit of a journey as we spotlight each of the albums and two of our favourite songs from each. So, David, if you don't mind, maybe we'll go back in time to the first album. White Stripes came out in 1999. You had, uh, well, maybe a little bit of background. This is an American duo formed in 1997 in Detroit, Jack and Meg White. This first self-titled album um, only hit UK charts at number 142, didn't really ripple with the US, produced by Jack White and Jim Diamond. So what's your first song off this album? Oh, well, the... One of the things about the White Stripes that I was noticing is that there is a simplicity, they're a duo, and I was really trying to sink my teeth into what was the discrepancies between their six albums, because there, because there's not too, you know, there's not that many variables. you got two members of the band. Meg kind of does a simple drumming style, whether that's pejorative or not, is up to the listener. I like it. Um, but the thing about the first album is that you just have all this raw energy coming out. There's, no, there's everything's almost got teeth. There's only like one song that's kind of acoustic uh, on it. So I think that like my first pick was the big three killed my baby. I love this. One. It just comes right in. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, yep, yep. And yeah, so I'm a big fan of that one. Uh, I think there's 17 tracks on that, and and a lot of them really aren't that long at all. It's like two, two minutes songs. Yeah. Actually, there's no such thing as a really um, long White Stripe song. I think if you did the averages across all their songs, across the, the, the discography, I think the average song length would be about two minutes. Never outstays its welcome, does it? Yeah, correct. Correct. Um, do you want me to do my second or do you want to go back and forth? Or um, Yeah, why don't you do your second? You might as well. Yeah, I also like you know same type of energy. I I thought that wasting my time. This was, is actually a hard album to pick favorites from because the whole thing sounds really good. Yeah. Um. And but I thought that that one stood out a bit. Uh, I found myself listening to those more more often than than the other ones, like keeping them on repeat. And yeah. that one is like I said, it's only what two minutes and fourteen seconds. Uh, Big Three Killed My Baby is just like a two and a half minute song. Yep. Um, but so much with so little. Uh, you know, going on there. Nice. That's a great start to the show. Well done. Um, um, I've actually picked Jimmy the Exploder. I think that is a cracker of an opening track. Um, initially, yeah. it kind of reminds me of another band called The Cramps. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Heavily into the fuzz and the psycho billy um, with a bit of blues thrown in because let's face it, this band is very much rooted in the blues, but taken through a different prison, even some may say modernised. It's got garage, it's got psychobilly, it's got blues, um, it's raw and grungy. And um, when you look at the lyrics, it's, it's about sex. It's, you know, that's rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. And I can remember um, when these guys hit the scene um, in 1999, there was a big word of mouth. And the thing I liked about it was there's only two of them. It's really stripped back. It really strips back the essence of rock and roll. No bass player, no rhythm guitar. Mm. It's just two of them. And yeah. it's primal. And, yeah, I think um, Jimmy the Exploder really sort of sums up the essence of the White Stripes, puts a bit of a stamp, this is who we are, and that's a great cracker of an opening track. The other one I wanted to um, spotlight is a little bit different is uh, Susie Lee. Now, oh, Su yeah. Susie Lee is a character that Jack White writes about quite regularly throughout his songs, lyrically. Um, some people say, is it about Meg? 
Um, some people think it may be a girl from, from the, the past. Um, he's been quoted as saying, I don't know what she looks like or who she is, but it's a character that I refer to. And I think he just puts his uh, sort of lyrics around this, this character, Susie Lee. This is a very simple song. It's drum percussion uh, driven. It's got wonderful slide, which is actually um, provided by Johnny Walker of Soul Dad Brothers. Really bluesy. And, you know, slide guitar being the uh, uh, the instrument of the devil, y'all. I love, I love dirty slide guitar. Um, I've chosen this song, Susie Lee. I think it's a cracker. So, But there's so many good songs on this album, Dave. So many good songs. Yeah. And I think yeah, we're no, going to be struggling it. as we go, you know, just to, to pick. So that's that's my one. Hey, another thing, um, a lot of people say uh, White Stripes sound like early Zeppelin. What do you think about that? You know, like Zeppelin 1. Can you sort of oh, see that? Well, you're leading me into what I was going to say about the second album. <laughs> All right, let's go in there, mate. Let's go in. Yeah. So we'll go to the so- go to the. Well, I'll go to the second one, and then you can you can jump in. So this is uh, called uh, "The Style." Um, this came out in the year two thousand. Again, it uh, really didn't trouble the charts. UK number one three seven uh, was produced by Jack White because Jack White, you know, basically produced all all the albums. Yeah, tell us what's your what's your picks on this album? Well. Um- my first pick, I picked Little Bird, and it really goes into how I see Jack White is kind of, well, let me just say something about the White Stripes. Like, when the White Stripes emerged, uh, and, like, around the time when I was in high school, they kind of had, like, there was a trend in comedy that was emerging, uh, Arrested Development, The Office, and stuff like that, like, with, with things being really like, quirky. That's probably the best word to describe it. And here you have like uh, an anachronistic group or an an anachronistic Jack White in a sense. He doesn't seem like he comes from his time, his old fashioned. He's dressed up in all like the old like country garb a lot of times. Uh, Before that, they were always uh, focused on the colors. They're wearing red and white all the time. They're a brother and sister, but no, they're not. They're a, they're a, a, a husband and a wife or ex-husband, ex-wife. So there's all this like quirkiness that's going on where they, they're very indie. And um, Jack always reminded me of Jimmy Page in the sense that he's obsessed with that dirty South, like that old South, like dirty blues and, and the riffing and everything. And the other person that he, he reminds me of is Neil Young. Uh, in the sense that Neil Young is uh, a bit of a shapeshifter where he goes into these different styles and also different bands and has all these multiple different uh, sort of like lives or careers. Uh, but he's he's diligent where he pumps out a lot of material, but he's not interested in being virtual uh, a virtuoso on the guitar. You know, Neil Young will do a solo that it, it seems like someone that was only learned the guitar for three months can do and the solo will be like three minutes long you know look at uh cortez the killer but those those going back to the 70s and that whole sound and that sort of like dirty like uh um blues riffy like very much like um in my time of dying and uh and when the levee breaks and and those type of like zeppelin riffs that's what that's what i get from little bird um and then the other song i also picked was death letter they they both have those like a, a, a bluesiness going on to them with that that real nice riff and uh the thing about the second album too that i noticed that was a, a difference is that this reminded me of led zeppelin 3 a little bit because the first album mostly has all that power that that rawness and that energy and this one has at least like five songs that are acoustic it's almost like mm. a third of it almost to a half is acoustic and then some of the other songs that have some teeth on them are more slower so it's not like that Jimmy the Exploder, like or or big uh, big three killed my baby type of like you know punch in the face aggression. There's there's a bit of it that's like more um, lighter and and reserved on this album. And I think that Jack White was probably conscious of the fact that he's not trying to be so virtu- uh, 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 virtuoso. So he has to figure out a way to still sound different and still have some ingenuity. 
So I think he he was it was a conscious decision to make it so that way there was there was in the sense that Led Zeppelin in one and two you had that heaviness going on, but then three goes into the folk and the country. So yeah, spot on with the Zeppelin thing then. Yeah, yeah, no worries. No, no, um, that's I really agree with your take on that. I'm choosing Hello Operator. Uh, production is super crisp, very Led Zeppelin. Reminds me of Living Loving Maid. Um, there's space between the instrumentation and Meg's drumming is simple, efficient and driving. Now, there w- there's been a recent wag um, that criticised Meg White's drumming. I won't even name him. And it created a bit of a shitstorm on um, social media. And it basically was along these lines, David, to say that um, the White Stripes would have been better if they had a, a better drummer. Could you imagine it? Seriously, Meg White is magnificent. Um, it's part of the band. She is basically the heart and soul. She drives it. She is like um, matched with the music. Um, if, if it needs a bit of an emotional um, sort of uh, punctuation, she'll, you know, she'll bang the snare drum or the, the cymbals. Very percussion orientated. Okay, she's no co- cosy pal, but for what the music is, she is absolutely spot on and she is nowhere a dud drummer. And I think that is just, it's sexist. Um, it's a redundant comment. And they're likely going to be uh, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which I think may be announced very shortly. I, th- I think they're a shoe in. And, you know, they'll do a little piece on stage, hopefully, and you'll see those two were just made for each other musically. And Meg, you know, just the, the way her drumming is part of the sound. You can't put a busy drummer, you can't put somebody that is technically... Um, a master drummer into that sort of band. It's garage. It's psycho Billy. It's it's um, heavy sort of blues. You know that really sort of riles me up. But um, I think that uh, <laughs> Hello Operator is a great song, and um, I love. Um, it doesn't go on for a long time, and you want more. That's what I wrote. It just goes on for it, you know, it's one of those two minute songs and you're sort of wanting more. And that's with a lot of these these songs, you know, Um, they compact so much in such a short period of time. And then you're just sort of yearning for more. And then you go on to the next one. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's great. The next one I was going to pick was Truth Doesn't Make Noise. Um, I like the piano. It's slightly out of tune but effective, and then you've got a counterpoint with the acoustic guitar, really heartfelt lyrics. You can imagine um, Jack playing this in a Western saloon, maybe in a Tarantino film. It's got that sort of soundtrack, and Tarantino has used a a white stripe, you know, the hateful eight, but it builds up to this crescendo with the electric guitar comes in and this underlying riff, you know, that, produces so much urgency. And I like the lyrics. If the protagonist is attempting to defend his love of somebody to somebody who doesn't understand. So I think it's kind of um, maybe a message to the the others that don't understand his relationship with Meg that, you know, it's kind of a middle finger type of song. You don't understand. You don't know who we are because there was so much interest in this relationship, wasn't it, David? Yeah, yeah, there's a mistake really- that they put on purpose, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, husband and wife, brother and sister, what are, what are the relationships like, you know? So um, the only thing, I, uh, other thing I want to talk about, uh, Desai, the album, is uh, the meaning of Desai is it was an art movement, a Dutch art movement, which was about simplified vertical and horizontal shapes, black and white primary colours, and that's what, inspired the White Stripes in regards to a lot of their album covers, their look, you know, red, black, red, white. Um, interesting. So oh. that's the uh, where the the name The Sty comes from in regards to the album. And I thought that was a little bit interesting. So I thought I'd just share that with the viewers. 
Um, but uh, yeah, that's my two picks. Hello, operator, and truth doesn't make noise. So yeah, definitely awesome. We go. We get into the more commercially successful. They're starting to build momentum, David. Um, White blood cells of two thousand and one. Jack White produces Australia, number thirty six. UK number fifty five. US number sixty one. Now it does hit single platinum in both UK and US, but it was probably more of the later albums that people were actually investing and going back into the catalogue. So that was a bit of a slow build, but they were definitely starting to get a little bit of commercial traction. What's your favourite tracks off this album? Uh, Well, for starters, probably my favourite White Stripe song is We're Gonna Be Friends. This is this is what um, would be called as a flex. This is Jack White flexing with emphasizing how the simplicity in the lyric. It's, it's going back to a very innocent uh, time where basically like two two kids, like, you know, the story goes that they're going to school and, and having a good time together and just a very, very simple melody, very simple guitar like uh you know, a rhythm going on. And it reminds me of when I had watched the documentary, uh, I believe it was the, it might be loud documentary with Jack. I don't know if you saw that, but he was talking about, he used to be a upholsterer and he was saying about the simplicity in, in his songwriting. He learned when he used to work as an upholsterer, because he's like, I learned that you just put, he said something like, I learned like you just put three staples and that's it onto the next one. When, you, when you're kind of like folding over to make a couch or, or a chair or something like that, when you're, when you're um, stapling like the leather or the, the fabric. And I guess at that point, he never over obsessed about the composition. He never stuck around and say, well, it needs to go four minutes longer. It needs this or it needs bass. At that point, like when you're listening to, we're going to be friends, Actually reminds me of like a, a Kinks type song. And I saw in an interview that he wasn't like a huge Kinks fan, but it was suggested to him that he does the Ray Davies quality to his songwriting. But that that uh that simplicity and just saying, look, I can do this, I can use such uh, a, a, a short list of elements and come out with something that sounds j- just magnificent. You just want to want to listen to it over and over and over again, and it packs that punch. So that, in essence, I think is a microcosm of Jack White in general. Yeah. Um, and it, it also doesn't have that, uh, it doesn't have any of that punch that they're known for, that indie rock punch. It's a very, a, a beautiful song you can play with your grandma. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it, so like, again, he's showing that, like, I can do something completely different. Don't put me in a box. You know, um, the other song I'll pick is is normally, like, I think this is pretty big when they when he would tour all the time and i think he still plays this is dead leaves in the dirty ground that's just got again we're going with some of that riffing meg's going i love the way that meg drums yeah he reminds me of animal from the muppets sometimes you know what i'm talking about just like hitting all the symbols and stuff there's so much um, so much joy yeah 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 she's having a good time but what's your take on this criticism of Meg? Do you, do you agree with my little rant um, about uh, Meg? Well, for, for I understand, I, I can appreciate what you're saying. I don't, I don't completely agree with what you're saying. Um, I do agree a little bit. I think that it fits the style of the music. There's a reason why she drums that way and she fits into that drum. I think that since the White Stripes came out, that was that criticism. I think when Jack went on to do the raconteurs, um, if that's the correct way that you say it, um, when he was like, you know, it'd be great if they had a full band and, and this, and he was performing with bass and, and a, a different drummer and everything like that. I think that for someone that w- Jack at one time pushed back and said, I don't like um, how she gets criticized so much when uh, one of the most popular forms of music in of our time right now is hip hop. And that basically is just going on like a drum machine beat. It's simple. There's nothing that's virtue, uh, like, you know, being really complicated about it, but yet like in my band, people are targeting her. Um, 
and I think it's just because she's she's shy and she, she just sort of like sits there and she she just does this and and it doesn't seem like she's doing all that she's not cozy Powell like you said yeah. so yeah I see that it fits I see that it fits but I'm not but I also understand that argument that's been there since day one that for someone who really enjoys drumming someone that likes Ringo Starr or like a, a Bonham or 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 like um a Bill Ward or something like that, like these classic, uh, le like uh, legendary bands, they might feel like they're coming home empty handed with just the simplicity of it. They might yeah. feel like they should have Jack White go on for a six minute song. You know what I'm saying? So I get it. I mean, I, and, and as far as like her, maybe some of the, the hates, maybe some of the hate is inclined because it's, it's, it's a female in a rock band. But I honestly think that if, a, if it was a, if it was a dude up there, and he was doing something that wasn't so crazy. Then people kind of be like, oh, he doesn't really know how to drum that much either. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? So like, I think it fits in with it. I don't feel like the, the drums need to change in this band. I think it, it it fits perfectly. And you can see that she does, she's very kind of specific. Like she'll do certain fills or she'll crash a cymbal. But as I said, I think it's like musical punctuation. It's like we're yeah. having a sentence full stop. So I think she's intuitive. It's not it's not trained technical drumming, but it's intuitive and it's emotional and it matches the band. And I just get a little bit frustrated that people are not seeing that. They're just thinking of the, the technical side of it um, because it's perfect for this band. This is stripped back primal rock. Because, you know, Jack White has gone on to more fully realised rock, even with his solo albums and a, and a drummer, an accomplished drummer, suits that sort of music meg wouldn't suit that but for this music where it's stripped back it's perfect it reminds so. me of like you you assume that because he was so driven and, and so musical and everything that it, it kind of reminds me of like paul mccartney when he started wings and he and he grabbed linda and he said listen i'm gonna i'm gonna teach you because uh, i need someone to play keyboard i need you to be here because we're married now and otherwise how are we gonna get married and she just played simple keyboard in the beginning. And eventually she learned her chops. But everybody was just like, how are you going to have someone who doesn't really know how to play an instrument standing next to Paul McCartney? You know what I'm saying? So I think that that probably might have been the uh, the narrative at first. It's like, this guy's really talented and and he, he needed somebody else around and there's his wife. And there's nobody else in the band except for a romantic unit. Yeah. Or at the time they were trying to sell that it was a brother and sister. Yeah, well, they actually got divorced around the time of White Blood Cells and they continued. Well, yeah. I think it might have even been prior to that, but um, um, there was some conjecture, um, should we split? But um, he really strongly encouraged, let's keep going. And they held it together and the mystique of whether, you know, they seem to be quite united. And he, he doesn't have a bad word to say about Meg. There's no animosity and um, Meg has always been quiet. You don't really see much of her in the in the press. You know, it's always been Jack has been the the mouthpiece of the band. Is my choice. I love the Lego film clip. Have you seen it? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a great great clip. I like it. it's punky. It's fun. It's rambunctious. It's two minutes of garage rock rock bliss. I love garage rock, and. Yeah. Um, a lot of uh, this is another one where a lot of people say it's too short, but I think it just doesn't outstay its welcome. It it makes its point and on to the next one. Um, but anything, you know, it's got this delicious fuzzy guitar. Um, and I love those fuzzy guitar lead breaks um, that um, Jack White, that's like his signature sound, isn't it? And um, it's really, really good on this song. So fell in love with a girl. Oh, I love this. Um, the other song that I was going to pick was uh, Expecting. Um, it's rock at its yeah. most primal. It's stripped back. It's raw. It's emotive. Um, I I was reading um sort of uh, some comments on this particular song, and someone said this is the best Black Sabbath riff ever by someone not in Sabbath. I thought that was interesting. I'd share that. Um, I like the lyrical content where it's about uh, expectations in a relationship and um you know, whether you get return gratitude or not in a relationship. And it makes you wonder a lot of this, is this like a microscope on his relationships with Meg? You know, it's it's open to speculation. But um, he's actually quite a, a, a fine lyricist if you look at his, um, you know, look yes. at the works of the White Stripe. It's a lot of um, 
observations about relationships and a lot of it's just you know from the heart so he's not a not a shallow fellow um the old jack white but um yep this is this is my album um uh, this is my song from the album expecting but um this you know you were saying about two minute songs there's some other ones that i i had um sort of on the on the fringe i i, I was going to pick i think i smell a rat hotel yeah. yorba <laughs> Hotel yeah. Yorba and uh, Aluminium. So I could have picked any of those. All right. Sure. Then we go into the commercial juggernaut of 2003, and that's Elephant. So this is where they really hit um, the, their commercial stride. Double platinum in the US, triple platinum in UK. This really, um, a lot of people say, sort of single-handedly um, resurrected Garage Rock. There was a Garage Rock revival. So you had a lot of um, bands following on the coattails, like the Black Keys, um, the Hives, um, a lot of other different bands, um, but they were definitely at the, at the peak and, and leading the charge. So in the US, this hit number six, UK number one, and Australia number four. Not bad for this type of music. And I think people forget how um, commercially successful the White Stripes were. So over to you, my friend. Give me the two songs right, so, that you pick up this album. So when the Elephant came out, I actually had this because there was such a buzz. And Seven Nation Army is so catchy. I used to listen to that all the time. The rest of the album didn't click with me when, you know, 20 years ago when this came out. It took about six years until it really... I understood like what the magic was of this, but I remember listening to it like 20 times and everything just sounded mediocre to me at, when I was that young. I was, I wanted to like it and I couldn't get it, but I was on the peripheral of getting it. And I was like, I'm going to come back to this. So the thing about this album that I noticed is that for one, Seven Nation Army is a huge anthem. And there's literally footage on YouTube of Jack being interviewed the year before this when White Blood Cells had hit. And he's saying, you know, we're never going to be that big. We're never going to have like a huge, big anthem song. And, and boy, was he wrong? Like, yeah. you know, he's like the he's like the biggest indie rock star, indie rock rock star, like ever. Maybe I, I can't picture anybody else that's like that holds that true. That didn't like burn out or unfortunately like pass away or something like that. Like he's still alive and kicking. Um, now. The thing that's different about this album too that he mentioned is that he started being comfortable with doing a lot longer guitar solos. Besides that, my picks, like uh, my second favorite, possibly my favorite, it's that war with we're going to be friends is you've got her in your pocket. Now from the research I did on this song, this, this underscores how great of a lyricist is, which you just said. Um, it's, it's a song, I guess, that was uh, an early written song that was at least from like 98 before their first album. And it's one of the only songs that doesn't have any Megan on it at all. So it's just him on an acoustic guitar and you got her in your pocket is a, is, well, it's about a song. It, the song is about basically a romantic relationship where the woman that he's with, he has a power over the power dynamic is at an imbalance and he knows it. And he basically, um, she's in a sense like so powerless that she doesn't have anywhere to go and he just always has a control over. So the the lyrics go over the fact that he, you know, kind of might get tied to her, but then when she wants to go leave and go with someone else, like, no, 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 you're staying right here. And I guess like it, maybe it's confessional in the sense that this is just a sort of inner conflict that you have when you're younger, when you, you, you don't want to be alone. Uh, but you, but, but, but somehow like you, you're, you're, you're being not, your, your ego's in the way and you're not, you're not being fair to the person that you love. You know what I'm saying? And you're just sort of benefiting from the, the power imbalance. So kudos to him for at least having the, the introspection to write a song about it, because I know that this is something that people go through when they're younger, when people, you know, teenage, at least like they're going to go through these, trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong about how far you go with boundaries and all that. Yeah. You got her in your pocket is a beautiful song. Um, the next song I got to pick is Little Acorns. 
Now, Little Acorn starts off with, I thought it was, I believe it's Earl Nightingale. He used to do like these 1950s, like spoken, uh, sort of like, um, not preachy, but uh, a, you can find them on YouTube. It was like, it'd be on TV or something like that and, and black and white TV and just basically speak about five or six minutes about something that would be like self-improving about, but it's not him. It's this guy, uh, Mort Krim, I believe is his name. And he was a Detroit broadcaster. And I thought that they had grabbed a sample from somewhere else and put this at the beginning of the song, but I think they actually got him to put, uh, to just start talking about how, you know, you take all your problems and you rip them apart as the lyric goes. And that's how you can sort of like get your goals done when, when you're in a dire straits and things are so heavy and, 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 and doomy and you don't know what you're going to do and you're in a difficult position. The best way to do it is just take a small step at a time. And as, as you know, Mort's like doing this spoken word thing, you just hear like a very old tiny like piano going on that Jack's probably playing. And then boom, like the garage just comes in with the guitars and then, and, uh, the thrashing and the cymbals and everything like that. It's just perfect simplicity. Love that song. That's killer. <laughs> That's absolutely killer. This, this album's really tough really tough to pick and i'm going to go probably a little bit more conservative um i'm not going to say predictable but a little bit more conservative i'm going to pick seven nation army simply because it is the signature song for this band you hear yeah. it in jingles you hear it at sporting events it's iconic and i have to spotlight it because um this really put the white stripes on the map in front of um in respect to popular culture and consciousness of just your average rock fan and that's a that's a major thumbs up did you know that it was originally um written as a james a potential james bond theme that's a bit no, of a hit scratch yeah yeah um he, he he uh he wrote this as putting um as a, a potential James Bond theme, thinking that I'll they won't, you know, ever pick me for a James Bond theme. But even he did one of his uh, tunes did get picked down the track. But uh, the other one I'm going to pick is a cover, and I think it's a magnificent cover. It's the old Bert Baccarat Hal David song. I just don't know what to do with myself. Yeah, how they deconstruct yeah. it, and it makes it just so much drama and passion and you've got meg thrashing the the cymbals and the drums um and it really sums up what i was talking about her how her drumming is like punctuation um not yeah. necessarily traditional with the fills but it just punctuates that you know the lyrics so they're looking at the lyrics and the emotion and, and she's just you know tapping away um i think it's a hair raising song it really brings the hairs on the back of my neck up. I, I love this interpretation. And this is an example of a cover where they deconstruct it and they make it their own. What do you, what do you think of this song? Oh, I love I think that's, honestly, I didn't know it was a cover. Maybe I had heard it before and I just didn't put two and two together, you know, when I heard it again. Dusty Springfield. Uh, Have you heard of Dusty Springfield? Yeah, she yeah, was, yeah. yeah, yeah. She said this, that was one of her signature songs. Yeah, she, um, I listened to a couple of her songs more recently. I, I was listening to some Freddie Mercury had done a, a right before he, uh, the first Queen album, he had done a, a cover of her song. What the hell was it called? Uh, Looking back or going back or something like that. And it's, it's gorgeous. If you're, a, if you're a Queen fan. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. yeah, no, that song's awesome. This a, it's a reason why this album is, is as big as, it, as it was, you know what I mean? Elephant is, no pun intended. Like it's it yeah. is a big album, yeah. Yep, and I love the uh, film clip with Kate Moss. Um, it's it you know um, directed by Sofia Coppola, but um, yeah, it's um, uh, they've got some really good videos, um, folks. Ch check out some of the videos um, accompanying some of these songs. They're great. Um, but uh, all right, moving on to a, a bit of. Change of direction, David. Um, Get behind me, Satan. Um, in two thousand and five, was a, a bit of a change in direction sonically, a bit less garagey, bit less bluesy, and um, trying a different path. So, um, yeah, well, what are your two picks um, from this album? All right. Well, with this one, this is we're going back to Led Zeppelin. 
comparisons, this is like the houses of the holy. Because it's the one where you're you're just seeing these different styles. Like you said, this the I think that he didn't want to be considered a, a one trick pony with the just aggressive garage stuff. So um he had just come off a Grammy uh, award uh, for producing Loretta Lynn's Van Leer Rose album. He worked with Loretta Lynn in 2004. And you can see how a lot of the piano and sort of, uh, um, you know, there's marimba on this, which I'm not even, it's, it almost sounds like a xylophone almost uh, kind of deal. So he's trying to do all these different, like almost like old timey songs on this album. And uh, my first pick and I didn't even realize that this was a single too, was uh, My Doorbell. I love it. There's no, you got the thrashing going on from the, from the drums, but it's just basically a piano. And this emphasizes another thing that's quirky about Jack White. I've seen Jack White in interviews and he does have a sense of humor, but you notice that in the, in the songs, there aren't really that, um, they're not too tongue in cheek when you listen to them. They're pretty straightforward, uh, lyrical, and they can be emotive. Sometimes it could be some tongue in cheek going on, but that's not really the impression you get. You see the tongue in cheekness and the fact that they're the colors and they're dressed up in those uniforms, something like that. But this one, it's just like when and he'll he has a very signature inflection in the way that he sings. So when you just hear the the hook and he's like, oh, you know, what are you thinking about my doorbell? When you're going to ring it? When you're going to ring it? Like he just has this quick sped up like way of singing. He does that on certain songs he does live. He'll do a completely like almost distorted version. And I love it. I love the way that he sings. It's his own signature. Nobody else sounds like him, uh, or at least before he did it. Do you know what I'm saying? So yes. Yes. beautiful song. Yeah. And and it's just basically how how do you convey like I'm waiting for somebody to get a hold of me? He doesn't say when are you gonna call me up on the phone. He like goes back to like a doorbell. You know what I'm saying? It, it reminds me of like at the time, this is like a couple of years before smartphones existed. So, it, and, and it has nothing to do with the internet. It's not like when you're going to email me or something, you know what I'm saying? So that's even old timey. The other song that I'll pick, and it's like two minutes is Little Ghost. And this one has, a, I guess it's a bit of a bluegrass type of vibe to it. I love, I love it. Um, there's, I don't know if he's double tracking his own vocal because when I went to look at the personnel, it didn't show. I don't own this album, so it didn't show who's doing like the backing vocal on it. But you can hear Jack with his sort of like a little bit of his hype up high. But I don't know if it's him singing low in the background and, he's, and he double tracked it or it's somebody else. But it's just it, it, it almost reminds me of like what I guess Skiffle too like was in, in, in England. It reminds me of... Uh, um, this is so re low resolution of a comparison, but I've just seen a face by the Beatles, you know, just being this quick little ditty. I and uh, yeah, I and it's, it's, it's um, apparently the lyrics are about a, a woman that he's, that he's got his eye on and she's so uh, stoic that it almost appears as if she's just a specter. And again, that's the quirkiness of the, the White Stripes having a song that's going to compare, you know, uh, or, or having Legos in the video. You know what I'm saying? Like all these little things. That, but like you can, if you didn't see all the aesthetic and you just heard the music, it doesn't, there's not like anything like goofy going on. Do you know what I'm yeah. saying? There's a wry um, sense of humor all the way through, I think, yes. a lot of the lyrics. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, nice. Well, well, well said, mate. Well said. Um one thing I forgot to just sort of say at the outset for this album is just some of the stats. Um, UK, US, Australia hit the same number, number three, which is uh, quite unique. Uh, US, it hit gold, and in the UK, it hit platinum. So still a high level of success in uh, 2005. Um, so this album for me, less punk, less garage, less blues, but more classic rock. It's listening. It reminds me of a lot of that early 70s singer-songwriter, classic rock sounding. And um, Jack has always been, a, a, a you know, he loves classic rock. He loves, um, he's a bit of a revisionist type of musician. And, um, yeah. you know, I, I really enjoy the direction that this album was taken, you know, like with different sort of instrumentation and, and a lot of very um, heavy piano Um 
influence um, across a lot of the, the tracks. Blue Orchid is the one I'm going to pick. I love his falsetto. He's got a mean falsetto, mm-hmm. and it's counterpointed against this really crisp, fuzzy riff. It's, you know, it is so crispy, <laughs> this riff. I just wrote yeah. down crispy. It's just so fuzzy, and it's just uh, a delicious I don't know if you can call a riff delicious, but it's delicious. It's just a delightful, <laughs> fuzzy guitar riff. Um, and Meg's going on it, going for it on the drums. Um, but um, the lyrical side of it is actually a little bit dark. Um, you know, the lyrics are, you took a wild orchid and you made it blue. I think it's a loss of innocence. And there's been some sort of speculation. It might be about child abuse. Um, so, you know, he is, you know, with all the mirth and the, the you know, sort of the humour, there is a, you know, he does cover some pretty heavy hitting topics and there's a lot of social observation. But um, I think this is a, a great song and um, I'm accordingly putting a spotlight on it. The next one I was going to do is the denial twist. Piano stabs, big chords. And, you know, these really big stabby piano chords and counterpointing with Meg's punctuation drumming. And then it leads into um, Jack with his riffage. And um, I like the lyrics of this. Um, It's giving advice to somebody who has been dumped. Um, And in regards to the twists and turns and the emotional roller coaster. So, um, yeah, I like the, the lyrics of this album. But, um, yeah, that's my two, Blue Orchid and The D- Denial Twist. But I'm a bit of a fan of this album. I think it's probably right up there as one of my favourite because I think it was sonically um, a bit different. So, um, you know, I don't know. It, maybe it's their, their end of the century. You know, like how you've got a, um, a discography and it sounds very similar, but there's one album in that discography that's a bit of an outrider, like with the Ramones and the End of Century. This this one, I think, is their end of the century because it sonically sounds yeah. so different. Yeah, that's why I give it the, like, Houses of the Holy to me. Like, Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know exactly what I mean. I think it's, pro- it's in the top two, I think, yes. from what I've been listening to. I think it's in the top two, at least. I rate it very um, highly. And you know something else is I noticed that, and again, I don't I don't know exactly, but on on Blue Orchid, right? Um, he's actually on some of these songs because I saw him pl- uh, playing some of this live. He's playing distorted Hammond organ, and I don't I can't make out uh, until I saw it being played. I can't make out if on some of these songs he's just playing guitar. Or he's playing the Hammond or I was playing like Uriah Heap gypsy style, ha- like dirty Hammond organ on, on some of these songs. Yes. Uh, and, and I can't tell if that's why there's such a staccato, like there's such a, a disconnect between the uh, the way that the 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 riff sounds on Blue Orchid, you know? Mm. It's very cut and 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 dis and disconnected. Yeah. Um it'd be something to look into because I couldn't find uh, I couldn't really find that out. Uh, yeah. I can't, I don't have an ear for that. You know what I'm saying? Until I saw mm. him actually playing it, it sounds, you know, fuzz is fuzz. <laughs> I love, look, mate, too much fuzz is never enough. I love the fuzz. Remember, yeah. the word is crispy. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I can't explain it. It's just my brain. <laughs> it just comes up with these funny words. Um, no explanation necessary. No, no, it's just. Just anyway. Um, all right. We finish up on the last album, uh, the final album in 2007, nicely called Icky Fump. Um, hit US number two, UK number two, Australia number three, went gold in the UK and the US. Bit more of a uh, return, like full circle to the early days of the garage blues rock sound of the band. Um, it was recorded in three weeks, which apparently it was probably the longest any of their albums have ever taken to record. Um, what are the uh, songs that you pick off this album? All right. This one. Yeah, this one definitely is a return. Uh, it almost sounds like they're trying to do uh, sort of like the first album again, but like they're they're uh, 
more seasoned as musicians and they've learned a lot of new tricks in the past eight years. Um, and I think that it comes out. So again, I got to pick this song. I don't know if this is a song that's a favorite of people, but this song makes me laugh. I love the, the wry humor that's in this rag and bone. So we've got a, we've got a crossover folks. We finally hit a crossover. All right. All right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, uh, I love how there's just this break in it where there's like a theatricalness where it's just Megan and, and, and Jack talking back and forth about trying to, I guess, do some sort of like wheeling and dealing to get stuff out of this person's house. I, I didn't know what a rag and bone. I had to look up what that meant. And, it, and it's like slang for someone who would just sort of like try to go around and, and buy something on the cheap that someone was getting rid of so they can sell uh, for more, more money. That's what it basically like trying to be very thrifty. And uh, you know, the, just Jack kind of doing the like, well, you know, I could use that if you want, but like, if you don't want to give it to me, that's fine. But, but if you do, I could definitely take it. And, and uh, uh, I love it, man. I, I think that that's, that just underscores the humor of the band, that right humor of the band that doesn't, that sort of, you got to look for it a little bit sometimes and it's there. Uh, so, so that color um, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Um, and it's, it's heavy. It's heavy. It's got, again, with the zeppelin -y, type of type of riffs going on the other song i gotta i gotta give this to it this song is almost nearly uh, an instrumental there's not that many lyrics in it but catch hell blues catch hell blues um is the first time maybe i overlooked this but meg sounds big I guess it's the bass drum that she's really going at because it sounds as big as like Bonham does at the beginning of when the levee breaks off Led Zeppelin four. Finally, like there's a huge like arena sound going on and, and Jack is just going riff after riff after riff after riff, different riffs coming off. off. It's, it, it would have been a nice closer. It's not exactly the last song on the, on the album. It's like the second to last. I think there's a, del there's a deluxe bonus edition has a couple more songs on it, but it makes you feel bad that that was the end that they didn't, you know, that maybe they'll come back and make an album again or something like that, but yeah. it makes you feel bad that they couldn't still, you know, do this type of style. Um, yeah. I love that catch hell blues. Yeah. Nice. Psycho Billy, whatever is the, is the term like psycho, psycho Billy. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Yeah. This is a very Anglo um a album um just in a lot of the pop culture references so like the word icky thump a response or a surprise and icky thump was referenced in a comedy show called the goodies which um our uk audiences or australian audiences may be familiar with that show um so it's a bit of a an english uh sort of a slang expression um i actually picked icky thump as my first um great heavy riff no chorus. It's kind of borderline metal, um, as metal yeah. as the White Stripes will ever get. It's got these multiple drum tempos, and I love he's using a different type of keyboard called the uh, clavelin. I don't know if you pronounce that properly. Very oh, Egyptian. Clavinet. Um, yeah. Very Egyptian sounding. Um, but, yeah, I think that's a, a great, great track. And I picked Rag and Bone as well. The melody reminds me of ZZ Top Lagrange. Think about it. Yeah, no, I hear that. Yeah. I hear um, that. It's rowdy. It's fun, noisy, simple riff. And it's a perfect um, summation of, of the White Stripes and their sound and everything stripped back and just getting to the essence of rock. And it's, it's nice that you finally get to hear Meg speak in this little, you know, back and forth dialogue. So, um, yeah, great album to finish off, but um, it's left us wanting more. And um, uh, look, I'm not sure that they they will get back together um, for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You you know, if they get inducted, I'm pretty sure you'll see them perform. But as a band, um, I think that Jack White is fully into his solo career and um, his multiple other projects and i think meg what i've read is she's um, more or less retired um from music um she really i haven't heard that she's done any other projects david 
since this band. Yeah, yeah. I think that what I remember hearing is that she has tremendous stage fright. And I think that's that I think that's apparent when you see her not really she doesn't really make eye contact a lot and she's just sort of like mm. in the background. She's very comfortable letting Jack take the reins. Yeah. Um I think she's very comfortable when he's on stage because it's probably, you know, somebody she knows. And um yeah. she's got that sort of comfort. Um, but um look, they will go down in history as one of the greats, and they single handedly have um, you know, sort of brought the blues and this garage rock and psycho billy or, or whatever you want to call it um, into popular culture and popular music. And definitely um, there are a couple of albums here that, um, you know, are rightly um, appraised as one of the, you know, some of the greatest rock albums um, of the last 20 or 30 years. So <laughs> sorry. Let me say, yeah, yeah, last point. You know what song has clav- clavinet on it that I remember learning? I'm going to think of it. Uh, Trampled Underfoot by Led Zeppelin. Yeah. That's the, that's the, the, um, like the, St- I believe that's the, the instrument, like the Stevie Wonder, like superstitious. Like, yeah. I think that's clavinet. Well, they've it's, got it here, clavio line. Um, I think that's how oh, you pronounce it, clavio line. I'm, yeah. Yes. Not the same instrument then. No, I can yeah. hear that. There's, there's, it sounds like there's some sort of like organ or, or some sort of key yeah. that's on that the sort of that's on icky thump. Yeah. I love that yeah. song too. It's, it's got a sort of an Egyptian sound, you know, like um, somebody with, um, you know, with a cobra and you're playing the flute. Yeah. Yeah. That sort of sound. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Anyway, any final words you want to say about the white stripes? What's your take um, on them? And, and where they where they yeah. stand? Oh, I think that they're bulletproof. I think if you 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 come into it knowing what you're gonna get, you're gonna getting a duo. Um, and uh, you keep an open mind about the fact that they're 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 sort of like doing a a very um, restrained big sound at times. And um, if you can get past the fact that Jack has a signature way of singing. Meg has a signature way of drumming. I think that you've you've uh, you you really like described it pretty well in the fact that she's like almost emotive and and she's not Carl Palmer, folks. <laughs> like she's yeah. not she's not going to be Carl Palmer. I think yeah. that I think they're great. I think they're great. I think that Jack. It's nice that Jack has been like like I said, Neil Young. It's nice that Jack has been able to go do different things, um, and that he didn't that he didn't stop when the White Stripes did you know, a good 16 years ago. Uh, well, at least the last album came out 16 years ago. So you at least have that. That's the silver line. There's like more than a, besides the white stripes, I think there's over a, over 10 other releases between Jack and, and, and the raconteurs and the dead weather. He released two albums last year. I think he had line Glastonbury. Yeah. He's alive and well, the, they're, they're alive and well. I don't think that these, these albums have aged at all. No, uh, excuse me. They haven't aged poorly at all. They've aged like a fine wine. There's people still pick them up and listen to them. They sound just as relevant now as they did before. Absolutely. Um, yeah. 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 Well, I agree with everything you've said, and I agree that um, they they have aged really well because um, when you're um, tapping into um, classic rock or um, blues, it's timeless and it doesn't date. Yeah, yeah. He fits in. He if you like if you like you know your your classic rock and you like your Zeppelin-y, that type of riffage and stuff like that, you're gonna find some of that here. It's 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 modernized, but you're gonna find some of it, and it's uncompromising. He's not trying to chase any trends or he do, he doesn't fit in, and that's what made him so great. He he was that's why I think put him on a pedestal. Yeah, absolutely, David. <laughs> you bring home the bacon yet again, mate. Thank you very much. <laughs> been a Thank lot you, of sir. fun. This has been a lot of fun going over the honor. of uh, White Stripes. Folks, um, if you're not familiar with the White Stripes, um, do yourself a favour and, and check them out because um, it's a rich catalogue and um, there's some great music there. So um, please like and subscribe to Rock Daydream Nation. You can see uh, David on The Contrarians and a lot of other shows and... Um, um, David and I will be definitely doing another show very soon. And um, yeah, 
cheers cheers to you my friend and um yeah leave you your comments well. and um yeah we'll catch up with you soon cheers bye all right it's an honor peter see ya <laughs>